My name is Rabbi Irina Gritsevsky. I wasn't born in Odessa, though I was born in uh, Russia. I was born in Leningrad, the city and the country that doesn't exist anymore on the map. Now it's called St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, actually for everyone who was born in the Soviet Union, uh, Odessa was a huge and important center. But now, after I studied in the US, uh, I'm a JTS graduate and I'm also a Schechter uh, uh, ordained rabbi. So uh, after having all these three worlds of Judaism, Israeli world, American world, and my Russian background, uh, I came back to work for Schechter as a director of Midrashat Yerushalayim, which is ex actually a nonprofit that um, uh, runs all our conservative communities in Ukraine, and we have at least four communities in Kiev, in uh, Chernovtsi, in Odessa. We have a conservative community and a newly founded community in Kharkov. Uh, we also have a school, a day school uh, in Kharkov, and uh, a Sunday school in Derdichev, and we run uh, an amazing uh, Rama uh, camp in uh, Ukraine now, which is really incredible <laughs> to know that something, uh, this amazing project exists also in Ukraine now. And that's what I'm doing in Schechter now. So it's kind of closing the circle for me. And uh, I'm very glad to be part of Schechter Institute. So after saying all that, we will really go to uh, Odessa. Let's jump there. We'll, we'll have to wait a little bit for Sarah because I need to get back my host rights in order to jump there. <laughs> but uh, okay. So meanwhile, I, I want just to tell you what to what kind of Odessa we are going to go because Odessa it's a huge, huge thing. And I will start with that, that for the Jews of the Pale of Settlement, which actually an area that Russia kind of inherited after getting the part of Poland, Russia inherited a big number of Jews that Russians didn't know what to do with. So they decided just to leave them there in this area. All Russian Jews are finally from this area. And to the Jews of the Pale of Settlement, there are uh, three important influences uh, into our culture. So one uh, important influence is actually something that you, are prob you probably know very well, and uh, it's uh, the Talmudic academies, uh, academies of great disti distinction in Mir, Slabotka, everything that happened and flourished in Lithuania. The Hasidic courts uh, of Lubavitch, Stalin, and the others that were in the Pale of Settlement in something that's called now Ukraine, and th this part, this important influence of uh, uh, the Jews of Pale of Settlement is not in Odessa. The traditionalism never got to Odessa, and you will find out why, but it's important to understand that everything that's connected to this kind of Judaism stayed to the north of Odessa and never got to the eastern part of uh, Odessa. Well, the other part of important influence is Zionism and the cultural influence. And one thing I was absolutely amazed when I came to Odessa is to find out that so many streets, I live in Tel Aviv, and so many streets names in Tel Aviv are actually have boards on the houses of Odessa because that's where they live at the same time in the same city. Uh, and really the number of ma names is amazing and one day we will go to this type of Odessa. It's Jabotinsky, Bialik, Shalom Aleichem, uh, Mendele, Mocher Tfarim, Ravutsky, Dubno, Fechada Am, and others and others. And it's a special, amazing tour of Odessa that we are not going to take now. Uh, what I'm going to take you to is the Odessa that I grew with, the myth of Odessa that I knew as a child. And that's the influence of the Jews of, uh, that lived in the Pale of Settlement 
inside the Russian culture? That's uh, a good question whether we should consider uh, and should, whether the rabbi should talk about that, you know, because that's the culture that was written in Russian, that was intended to, the, to Russians uh, and, uh, you know, to everybody. But uh, for me, the answer is clear for one reason. The first and the second type of Judaism, uh, everybody who grew up in Soviet Union just wasn't, we, we didn't know it exists. It wasn't part of our Jewish identity. While the third part was actually the important part of our Jewish identity and that's how it was built. So someone who thinks that the identity of the Soviet Jewry was weak is mistaken. It was very strong built Jewish identity, but it wasn't built on the first and the second part, but mainly on the cultural uh, part of the third type. And that's the kind of uh, tour I want us to take. So let's go to Odessa. Steven Zipperstein was one of the main researchers that studied the history of the Jews of Odessa. And that's how he described the 19th century Odessa. 19th century Russian Jews, and I want, it's a small language thing, but I want to notice that when I wrote about the influence of Jews, I, I called them Pale of Settlement Jews after thinking a while, while uh, Stephen Zipperstein and his book was published in 86, in 1986, he calls them Russian Jews. So that's, you know, once we all were Russian Jews, but nowadays there are separate countries. Odessa is in Ukraine, so you don't want to call nowadays uh, those people who live in Odessa Russian Jews. And it's one of the amazing things I'm learning now coming to Ukraine is that there is a new type, a new identity of the Ukrainian Jews is uh, developed in the recent years. And this kind of, um, you know, when while uh, we, we are all from the same pool, nowadays with the independent Ukraine, uh, you can hear different voices. So there is kind of a, a cultural uh, interesting thing going on when Ukrainian Jews, they really uh, see all that as their inheritance, while it's also the inheritance of many others who have not lived there. So 19th century Russian Jews saw the city of Odessa as many things. In Yiddish folklore, it came to be associated with a life of comfort and pleasure seeking, with indifference to religion, and here you see the uh, non-traditional part of Odessa, with the criminal underworld, and even with glamorous women. No other city in Russia resembled Odessa. If Odessa could be compared at all, it was only the port cities of America, and then only to those on the frontier, like Chicago or San Francisco, where a mixture of enterprise, license, and violence combined to create environments free from the restraints of the past. Uh, here you can see the map of the Pale of Settlement. So probably, uh, and that's the border, right? I, I, I was born here in St. Petersburg. Uh, so so my, my family kind of for many generations lived there, but they received a special permission to live outside the Pale of Settlement. Most of the Jews lived here. Uh, and uh, my mother's side also, they lived here. That's the Poland. Uh, and Lithuania is here. Um, Belarus is here. So that's all parts of... Um, this map is from 1825 when Odessa already was part of the Pale of Settlement. But in the beginning, Russia didn't have any access to the Black Sea. All this area was actually conquered in the Turkish Wars in the end of the 18th century. And Odessa specifically was conquered in uh, 1789, uh, Tatar Fortress. It's situated here. You see a very strategic place. And uh, a small Tatar Fortress near the town of Hashi Bey was conquered and six years later it was renamed Odessa. So for Russian government of that time, it was for Russian Tsars, it was extremely important to keep this area. It was their exit to the sea, to the trade uh, and the control of this area was crucial. So when they conquered this place, 
the area wasn't populated almost. There, it was very uh, few people who lived there. And they made a, a very uh, important decision to uh, allow people to live there. So they wanted to bring their Greeks and that's why the name Odessa. Odessa is a Greek name and the idea was to bring Greek settlements there. And people from all around the countries, the runaway slaves came there because they, they could receive uh, their freedom. You remember that Russia of that time had a real slavery that actually continued to the mid middle of the uh, 19th century. And that's, that was the beginning of Odessa. The first uh, mayor of Odessa was Osip Diribas, who was a Spanish officer, and he was the one who conquered uh, Odessa, and he starts building the port, which is an important part for Odessa, because the port it made Odessa what it is today, actually. In 1804, uh, uh, Duke de Richelieu, uh, a person who runs from the French Revolution, he's a, uh, he's a French, comes to the city and he actually makes Odessa great. He builds the most important institutions, the port, he negotiates with the Russian Tsar uh, all the uh, conditions of the city. And uh, under this French government, Odessa becomes the international city where Jews are really, really welcome. And that's that explains why Odessa, that wasn't in the beginning the part of the Pale of Settlement, uh, becomes such a heavily uh, populated city by Jews and also by all kinds of other nations. There are, there are people from all around there and the names of the street are telling that. It's really an international city. One of the people who came there was Mark Twain. Mark Twain in 1867 comes to Odessa the first thing he sees is the port. That's the port. That's the port today, but uh, it wasn't very different. The port is an important part of this. It's a sea uh, city. So you can see that the port is a little bit lower than the main city. So from the port to get to the city, you have this amazing stairs. The stairs were called Richelieu uh, stairs. Now it's called Patsomkin uh, stairs. Here uh, you can see Richelieu, uh, the name of Richelieu, the first uh, real governor of the city. He gave name to many important places in uh, uh, Odessa, to their football club, to the, to the cognac that they produce. And when you go up those stairs, if you go, I didn't do that. I, 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 I went down, I thought it would be easier. <laughs> but if you go up those stairs, uh, upstairs you will find this monument of uh, Richelieu, who is very uh, appreciated there. And uh, from here, the old city begins. Mark Twain said like that, I have not felt so much at home for a long time as I did when I raised the hill and stood in Odessa for the first time. It looked just like an American city, fine broad streets and straight as well, low houses, two or three stories white, neat, and free from any quantness of architectural ornamentation. Locust trees bordering the sidewalks, they call them acacias. A stirring business look about the streets and the stores. Fast walkers, a familiar new look about the houses and everything. Look up the street or down the street this way or that way, we saw only America. That's what Mark Twain saw in Odessa, only America. But then he turns uh, around, <coughs> he sees the church, and then he says, that's Russia. The church is the, is the Russian part. But uh, for him, uh, it was very similar to, uh, to uh, America. So what about the Jews in Odessa? The Jews came, the Jews came to, uh, in, Adair first as, uh, in Odessa first as Turkish prisoners. So some of the Jews were in the city of Hashubei. They already stayed there, uh, but just a few. Uh, the first community was actually Spanish because, uh, um, because Russians allowed all the uh, Turkish Jews uh, that they conquered to settle in Odessa. 
the, this, uh, the other way is connected to the port immigration. Uh, when a port began to be an important place, and actually young male Jews came to Odessa, kind of uh, like Russian Eldorado, you know, looking for money. All Odessa Jews came to live solely for themselves. Uh, that's the saying that was, uh, that was used at the same time. So what happened at this time uh, is actually materialism and the erosion of traditional values. Uh, the main wave that actually changed uh, the city a lot was uh, the Galician Jews that came there that came there uh, and brought what's called Askala. But the Askala that came, the Enlightenment uh, that came from Galician Jews was adopted the, uh, the way that Dessa likes it. So in a very uh, light way, let's say it like that. But one of the things that Ascala did in Odessa was the modern system of education. And there was an important system of education. You can see, see here a big synagogue that was situated on this street. That's the modern picture and that's the old picture, but the building looks nearly the same. Now, the street is called Jewish Street and it's in the center of Odessa now. And, and them too. Jews never lived in a ghetto in Odessa. They lived all around the city, but there are still areas where there were more Jews because they were around the synagogues. And this uh, was one of the streets where Jews lived. Of course, it changed its name uh, in the Soviet time several times, so it wasn't called a Jewish street. Uh, but uh, it was known always in Odessa as the Jewish street, and now uh, in the post-Soviet times, it still uh, has a name, Jewish Street. The name was returned, so when you go in the middle, the center street in Odessa, and when you go there, you can really see the Jewish Street. You can really see the Jewish Street. And uh, the funny thing, and it's, you know, from those stories that can happen only in Odessa, that another important building that was here in the Soviet times, was the uh, department of the local KGB that was situ situated just not far from a synagogue. So that can happen only in Odessa when uh, the department of the KGB is actually situated on a Jewish street. So what happens uh, in the end of the 19th century is uh, the uh, pogroms. The pogroms, uh, some of them were great, and some of them, uh, they were smaller, and then there were uh, a, an important pogrom of 1871 and uh, of 1905. Uh, they were connected to the, to the big decline in the economic situation of Odessa. So some of the reasons were that there were other centers, other ports on the Black Sea that started to uh, flourish. So there was a uh, great competition and the development of the railways wasn't good for Odessa. Uh, so actually the situation in Odessa started to decline and that's when uh, the world of uh, poor Odessa, poor Jewish Odessa appears. And uh, all the stories about the areas like Moldovanka, uh, they're from this time from the decline of the economic Odessa. So that's also when a, a, a smarter Jews from Odessa, let's, <laughs> I, I can tell that, they uh, just take the sheep and come to Israel to influence life in Israel. And there is a, 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 an amazing story about the ship that had a great number of uh, uh, people from Odessa that influenced greatly uh, on the uh, culture of Israel. But there are also those who stay in Odessa and they are greatly influenced by Russian culture around. All the modern system of, system of education is a Russian system around. So their native language becomes some kind of a weird language that exists only in Odessa. And I can tell you as someone who speaks Russian, when you come to Odessa, you are surprised to listen that it's not exactly Russian, it's not exactly U Ukraine. It's something very strange. Uh, it's, it, it's a very strange dialect that was ac actually invented, uh, invented there. 
And now, uh, on that background, uh, I want to take you to the world of Isaac Bade, who is actually uh, someone who created Odessa for Russians. So when uh, anybody who lives there, who lived there, uh, thinks about Odessa, his name comes first, and I think he's kind of forgotten in our Jewish culture. Um, maybe, uh, and maybe it's not deserved. So here you can see the pictures, and that's the picture of Babel himself. That's one of the areas of Moldovanka. Moldovanka is the uh, area of Odessa where many poor Jews lived. It's kind of a small houses, poor people, and that's the criminal area of Odessa of the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And that's nowadays monument to Babel that uh, is on the Rishelyev Street, Rishelyevska Street. Uh, and that's where he lived when he came back uh, near the house where he lived. The wheel that's here, uh, everybody asks what this wheel is. So there are many explanations to what this wheel is. One explanation is that it's connected to the uh, one of his first books was Red Cavalry, which actually told the story of Russian Revolution uh, in Odessa of that time. And the wheel of revolution was broken. <laughs> the other explanation that it's the wheel of life, which actually was very cruel to Babel. Uh, Babel uh, himself was shot by firing squad in the Lubyanka, the department of K uh, the building of KGB in Moscow in 1940 and when you uh, we will talk a little bit about what he did in his writing you will not be surprised uh, and uh, that's the reason why uh, the, uh, the, uh, he was dead and then for 14 years his family didn't receive any notice about his death they thought that he's in jail and only 14 years later when Khrushchev came to power they could find out that he was actually executed uh, of course, his books were prohibited on only in the 60s, uh, 70s, he, uh, he's been published uh, and known to a Russian public. Actually, his family did a great job of uh, kind of preserving and translating his books into English. So his books uh, translated and even more than in Russian sometimes uh, by his grandchildren who live in the United States. Uh, and uh, they managed to, uh, his family managed to, uh, to get out before he stayed. And, uh, and uh, some of his works were actually lost uh, when he was uh, arrested. The main, uh, the main book that he's known for is Odessa Stories. Uh, Odessa's story is, is uh, uh, a story of a gangster that uh, kind of runs the streets in Odessa, a Jewish gangster. Um, he has a, a real prototype, uh, Benny Creek the King, that's the name of the hero, but the name of the prototype is Mishka Yaponchik, and he really uh, lived and his story is very similar to the story of Benny Creek. When you read the Jewish encyclopedia, they say that the, main, the most important uh, thing that Babel uh, created, he created a strong Jew that could protect, could fight and protect uh, uh, himself. And one of the things that Mishka Iponchik did when pogroms were in Odessa, he used his gangsters to protect the Jews. Uh, uh, when you read the book now, it's, it's a hard reading because He's a gangster, so he does a terrible, awful things. It's kind of a, a Al Capone, uh, right, of American culture. Um, right, Jonathan. Jonathan said by his daughter, uh, Natasha, right, and by his, uh, 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 yes, and, uh, and by her children too, and by his, uh, right, she did, uh, Natasha Brown, she did a great job, and really, uh, thank you, thank her for, <laughs> First of all, for smart move to have moved into the United States on time and uh, for keeping all this record. Uh, she did an amazing job, right? You're right. 
but also his uh, grandson from uh, uh, his second wife who stayed there in, in Russia, uh, his Russian wife. Right. Uh, so let's talk about his lightning quick rise and his terrible end. That's how uh, the story, how it was done in Odessa starts. It's of course about the start of Benia Creek and his terrible end, but it's also about the amazing start of Babel and his terrible end. One of the amazing stories, uh, things about uh, Babel is his language. That's the hardest part to translate, the hardest part to understand. But what Babel does amazingly is to recreate an incredible, incredible Odessa language uh, for us. Odessa is a horrible town. It's common knowledge, instead of saying, uh, it's common knowledge, instead of saying a great difference, people there say two great differences. And today, Suda, here and there, they pronounce Tudoi and Sudoi. So it comes, that's from Bible's essay, and it comes to say that there is a special atmosphere of uh, the language here. A special interplay between bravado and counterintuitive understand, uh, understatement. Uh, his critic, Viktor uh, Shklovsky, said, Bible's principle device is to speak in the same tone of voice about the stars above and gonorrhea. So just two quotes to kind of uh, keep the atmosphere of Babel with us. Just forget, that's the beginning of his book. Just forget for a minute that you have spectacles on your nose and autumn in your heart. Stop being tough at your desk and stammering with timidity in the presence of people. Imagine for one second that you raise hell and in public and stammer on paper. You are a tiger, a lion, a cat. You spend the night with a Russian woman and leave her satisfied. You are 25. If rings had been fastened to the earth and sky, you'd have seized them and pulled the sky down to earth. That's of course about Benny Creek, the king. And that's how the book starts. But I think the beginning of this phrase is actually what the Babel books is about to Russians. Because saying that it created a strong type of Jew that could resist himself, it's probably right for someone who lives in Israel. But when the book was published in the 30s, it was, the resistance was already impossible. It was already not about the physical resistance, but it was about this first phrase. Forget for a minute that you have spectacles on your nose and autumn in your heart. And that's what it brought to us, to the readers of it in the Soviet times. And another example, just to show you that it was uh, kind of a combination of a great thought and it was very, very, when you read this, you understand why uh, um, Bible ended uh, his life as he ended. And uh, after Benny Creek, Benny kill, uh, Creek kills so, uh, someone by mistake and he comes to his mother, uh, Aunt Persia. Aunt Persia, Benny then said to the dishevered old woman rolling on the floor, if you want my life, you can have it. But everyone makes mistakes, even God. This was a giant mistake, Aunt Persia. But did not God himself make a mistake when he settled Jews in Russia, so they could be tormented as if they were in hell? Wouldn't it have been better to have the Jews living in Switzerland, where they would have been surrounded by first-class lakes, mountain air, and Frenchmen galore? Everyone makes mistakes, even God. That's what Babel was about. And now we will switch so nearly the same time, uh, nearly the same time, uh, Ilya Ilf, who wrote the book 12 Chairs and Golden Calf, where they created the, uh, another corn uh, person, uh, Ostap Bender, who was called the Great Combinator. And uh, what we know about him is that he knew 400 relatively legal ways to make people part with their money. So uh, 
uh, this is an amazing book that has lots of movies made upon, and one of the movies is American movie in the 70s. Uh, Mel Brooks created a movie using uh, this scenario, using Ilfen Il uh, Petrov's uh, 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 screen. Luckily enough, they were not killed in the Soviet time, they just died young. Uh, Ilya Ilf died in 37, and his Russian partner Petrov died in 42. So uh, we don't have such a tragic story about them. But the book was actually a, a book that was quoted by any person who lived in the Soviet Union. It was uh, the story about impoverished aristocrat from Imperial Russia that uh, was summoned to deathbed of his mother-in-law and she reveals before dying that a fortune uh, had been hidden from the Bolsheviks and it's in the chair. Uh, that was um, th that was one of the 12 chairs that was sold. So there starts the quest by him and by another priest that uh, that heard it when uh, on, uh, from uh, from this mother, he, from the dying woman's confession. Uh, and Osta Bender, a person that his prototype was Jewish and he was born from the Odessa. He speaks the Odessan language, and they start the quest to find those chairs. Here you can see that's the picture of Ilf, uh, Ilya Ilf, and that's in the city of Odessa, in the, uh, just in the center of the city, the 12th chair, the last chair that brought a huge disappointment to the heroes. Uh, just a few quotes for us. Uh, one of the story when they come to, uh, they create a secret society and that's how they want to choose one of the heroes to be uh, a leader of the society and they speak about votes. Let's put it to a vote. Shall the ballot be open or secret? We don't need Soviet style voting, Cherushnikov said, offended. Let's vote the honest way, the European way, secret vote. So uh, you understand that this open critique, uh, even as a joke, was very problematic. And that's what's amazing about this sort of humor, that somehow it managed to resist the uh, irresistible uh, surrounding. Pot Kaloshin uh, asked tragically, uh, tragically, why are you keeping quiet like the League of Nations? <laughs> we are speaking about the beginning of the League of Nations. And actually, there is a joke about them being quiet in a many situations uh, that happened then. He loved and suffered. He loved money and suffered from their absence. Uh, maybe I should also give you the key to the flat where I keep my money. This sentence was used everywhere when someone spoke about something that cannot be done. And the last one, stay strong, the West will help us. This is something that you would use when you would speak about situation when there's no, uh, no help that can be solved. You would say the West will help us because the help obviously will not come. Uh, as you understand, it was possible in the 20s, 30s, and then it was killed in the 40s and uh, 50s. But what developed uh, in parallel was the culture of the anecdote. Uh, anecdote is not just a joke for Russians. This culture, uh, this is folklore. It's something that was transmitted uh, uh, by people and uh, uh, something that was transmitted by people. Uh, and uh, a big part of those anecdotes were political. So one example, the competition for the best anecdote was announced. The first prize is 25 years. As you understand, it's 25 years in prison. And uh, the, fu uh, the funny as it is, it's actually the truth. So uh, one of the uh, ways the researchers learn now about the anecdotes is by searching the KGB files. Uh, so actually people who say, there was, and still it was something unstoppable. It was impossible to stop this folklore culture that was all around. Uh, Leonid Ilyich, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, of course, one of the leaders in the 70s of the Soviet Union, 
What's your hobby? I'm collecting anecdotes about myself. Have you collected a lot? Two and a half camps. So that's uh, how many people <laughs> would sit for saying any political anecdotes. And one last one, also already from the period when Jews come to, started to come to Israel. A Jew takes to Israel a portrait of Lenin. What's that? He is asked by the Soviet custom. This is not what, but who. This is Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Who is this? He is asked by the Israeli customs. This is not who, but what. This is the golden frame. So the anecdotes are kind of tough to translate and kind of tough to, uh, to bring because you need to know the culture, but that's what helped people to survive in the toughest time when even talk was dangerous. And on that, um, uh, and after that comes the last generation that I want to talk to you about. And the main representative of it is Mikhail Zvanetsky. So when we're speaking about, the, uh, uh, about him, it's actually the after war, it's actually the after war generation. Uh, Zvanetsky was born just before war. His family managed to uh, escape uh, from Odessa. Uh, his family managed to, uh, to escape from Odessa. And uh, after uh, war, he came back to Odessa. So he lived in Odessa for most of his important life. He, uh, after that, he came to Moscow when he already became famous. But uh, that's the after war generation in Odessa. And we should remember that Holocaust happened in Odessa. It was not as harsh as in other parts of in Lithuania and in other places because Romans, uh, Romanians were there. But many people were died. M many people died in the Holocaust in Odessa. And uh, those who managed to escape, that's the after war generation. Mikhail Zvanetsky is uh, recognized as one of the important uh, people there. Uh, he is a honorary citizen of Odessa. He has a street on his name. And uh, he wrote a lot to promote the Odessa country for uh, the culture for Russians. And uh, he, one of the things that is amazing about those people that they managed to write they managed to walk on ice, kind of uh, say what they wanted, but in a very soft and, uh, way that they were never caught. Uh, uh, so just a few quotes from him uh, to give you some kind of taste. Uh, optimists believe that we are living in the best of the existing worlds. Pessimists are afraid that it's indeed so. Every time when I recall that the Lord is fair, I tremble for my country. And he means Russia, of course. I change my bright memories for fresh sensations. Nothing hurts a person like fragments of one's own happiness. It's okay uh, if they laugh at you, much worse if they cry over you. So this type of Odessa humor was part uh, of any Soviet existence. And I asked myself, why Odessa? What happened there and what Odessa brought to, uh, to anyone here? Uh, so I, I will finish uh, and uh, I will allow you to ask questions. Uh, with uh, something that Zvanetsky told, and I think that's what important to know about the Soviet Odessa and about the humor there. Under the pressure from outside, humor is born inside, said Zvanetsky, and that uh, the humor was the only way that uh, resistance was possible at that time, and that's the only, uh, it was kind of necessary for Odessa that was born as the place of freedom and good life. Odessa started her quest for freedom and good life that was uh, stopped in the middle by a uh, revolution. And uh, since nothing else was possible, that's the ways to which uh, the culture developed. 
where the most possible resistance uh, was the only one in the world uh, where actually the resistance was impossible. It was definitely humor through tears, uh, as uh, it was clear to everyone what the situation was, and uh, the soft humor, the humor with hints, you know, uh, was the only one possible to survive, and that was the connection the unsaid connection between the, Jew, uh, the Jews who lived in the Soviet uh, Russia. And of course, the special language. You know, one of the things that you uh, realize when you come to Odessa and you speak to Odessa Jews is that you never know when they are serious and when they are not. It's kind of a language that uh, when they say something to you, it takes you just a few seconds to realize whether what they say to you is a joke or it's actually uh, a serious thing and it's always something uh, in between so it's a special style that um, really really um, when you go there you uh, just uh, you just can't not to be in love with the special city uh, as it is and i hope you enjoy enjoy the tour and maybe one day uh, you will be able to take a real tour through Odessa and really to see all the facets of it because one of the special things about Odessa is that it does has a lot of facets. So I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions and to hear any uh, remarks if you have uh, any. So please unmute yourself and, uh, uh, and I'm happy to answer your questions. The shul today, yes, uh, yes, of course. So uh, the community in Odessa is relatively, uh, relatively new. It just for a few, uh, for a few years exists. We have an amazing leader there. Uh, uh, thank you. And um, so uh, Odessa now, and that's, I find it paradoxical, right? That the city that was the city of um, kind of, uh, you know, of, um, resistance, the city of, uh, uh, you know, flourishing, of kind of uh, going against the traditional values, now became um, the, the two main communi uh, communities in the city are the Lithuanian co community and the Chabad community. There's all around Ukraine mainly, but also in Odessa. So those are two big institutions. Uh, except for that, there are two small institutions, which is the reform community and the conservative community. But they play an important role in, uh, in Odessa today. So we do have a community that is very diverse. It has an older members, but um, it's mainly young. Uh, and uh, most of the members there are younger than me. So, uh, so they're Ukrainian Jews uh, already, not Russian Jews. They're, they're born in a new uh, reality of uh, the special division. Yes, Zay Waxman is the leader of the uh, of our community there, and uh, his wife. He has a son now, newly born son, and it's a, it's a very warm and it's not big. The community is not big, but it's growing. They are opening a, a kindergarten right now uh, because they have a new a lot of kids. They have uh, small kids who are growing in this community, and uh, it's an important um, it's an important to have it there because I think for me what conservative community brings to this kind of city is actually the preservation of the culture that a real Odessa is, the intellectual Odessa, the Odessa of humor, the Odessa that you know is so core. I think it's so core to uh, to our values. Uh, to keep this. So for me, it's, uh, it's very important that we have a community there. To talk about Bialik and the Hada Am, I'm ready to do that and we will schedule a special virtual tour to the Odessa of Bialik and the Hada Am because I won't give them just one minute. They deserve, deserve a lot more than that. Yes, there is a tension between Lithuanian establishment and Chabad because if you have uh, if you have more than two, it's not open, but there is a tension. 
because if you have two communities, there is always a tension. Yes, Shalom Aleichem, of course, is there. I wanted to concentrate on the people who wrote in Russian because that's very unique and you won't talk about them without me. But yes, Shalom Aleichem was definitely part of my childhood too because he was translated into Russian definitely and he influenced a lot uh, Bialik and the others. He was part, you know, till the Yiddish culture was killed by the death of Mikhail in the uh, Soviet Union. It was allowed. And that's what I remember as my culture, going to Yiddish concerts and all that, when it already returned. Kosher restaurants, yes. I had uh, a dinner in a kosher restaurant in a synagogue. Actually, I think it was the one that you saw in our tour. In that restaurant they have, a, uh, in that synagogue, they have now a kosher restaurant. Amazing, but they do, they do have kosher restaurants. More questions? Yes, there are a lot to talk about Odessa and definitely every one of its citizens deserves a special, uh, a special tour. Um, so there is a lot to talk about Bialik in Odessa and Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky wrote uh, his book five in Russian. So he's kind of in between, right? He uh, just Zionist bought him. <laughs> they expropriated him into Israel. So the moment he became Israeli, Russians don't see him as theirs, but actually he was. He started his career as a Russian writer. Um, sorry, let me see. Uh, yes, there is a unique Odessa dialect that is a unique blend of Yiddish, Russian, and Ukraine. And there is a language of Russian criminals uh, that was created uh, under the influence of Odessa Yiddish. So you will be surprised that Russian criminals speak a lot of Yiddish. There are many words and uh, it's called Fenya, the criminal language. It's forbidden now to speak in prisons, but everybody speaks it. So in this kind of a special language, most of, a lot of words have Yiddish uh, roots. So Yiddish gave this kind of push into uh, Russian language in a underground uh, language. Uh, do we have a working relationship with the Orthodox groups? Uh, not much, uh, not much. Uh, they know we, that, we ex that we exist. There are, sometimes we do have programs uh, that, you know, people from all communities participate. We have a, a joint forum that they have also is a part of it, but um, there is, everybody lives their own life, mainly. There is an interesting website in Russian that describes the streets, buildings, and residents of Odessa from around the year uh, 900. Can you use Google to think? Oh, oh, thank you. That's just a remark. That's not something for me. Um, there are lots of information. One of the things that is uh, on the internet, but one of the things that it's so hard uh, is to know what's true and what's not. The influence of Odessa humor on Jewish American comedy and humor, that's the great question. That's really something that deserves the research. And if once I will have time, that's something that I would love to make a serious research. One of the things that I found out that all research about Odessa stops in the uh, revolution times. It's very few who really did something uh, beyond that. And that's why it was very important for me to do that, this today. So uh, Brighton, Brighton is uh, <laughs> kind of a vulgar way of Odessa in America, right? Uh, so it's uh, what happened in Brighton, even though people from many places came there, but the culture of Brighton, the language they talk there, the music of the Russian immigrants there, it's the Odessa uh, style. Uh, let, let's say it like that, including the criminal elements, right? It's part of it. Uh, as a Russian mafia or whatever, the folklore around that. So it's definitely there. Uh, I, I don't know about the uh, Jewish American comedy in general, uh, and I think it's interesting uh, study to do it, how it actually influenced, uh, but I'm not, um, I don't know. In the early 20th century, 
was there an influence on the small shtetls uh, in Ukraine? Influence of what? I don't really understand the question. Uh, if Odessa culture influenced uh, the small shtetls in Ukraine, I think shtetls brought to, uh, their culture to Odessa because people from shtetls came to Odessa and they kind of created this Yiddish culture, but more but more with tendency to freedom. That was what, that was so special in Odessa. It was more towards freedom. Uh, oh, uh, Allah, uh, that thing. I, uh, Allah, I'm so glad you are here because I have to tell you that you are well remembered. There's no city in, uh, I have not met you personally, so it's great for me that you are here. And I have to say you that every city in uh, Ukraine, I came uh, there, everybody remembered your visit. So it's great, <laughs> it's great to meet you here, even though uh, we have not met before. Uh, do Jews from Odessa still move to Brighton Beach? Uh, Odessa by the sea. So uh, I think nobody anymore moves to Brighton Beach. I think it's a myth exactly as Odessa. Everybody moves from Brighton Beach to New Jersey. Am I right? That's the tendency <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> so uh, Brighton Beach uh, is kind of a... Yes, uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, is it safe to tour Odessa today? I think it's safe. I think it's... Um, uh, it's safe as anything in this area. Of course, any travel has its own dangers, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's not a criminal city anymore. It has its own uh, rules. Of course, it's better to go there with people whom you know, but uh, uh, you do have a conservative community there that will be very happy and I'm happy to connect you, to help you and to take you around. And uh, one of the things that people in Ukraine are so... Um, looking for, and that's why, you know, I, it happened that, you know, someone here uh, is, has been there and people remember it for years. Because one of the things I think, I think that's so important for conservative Jews in Ukraine, it's this kind of connection, to know that they are not an island in the world and that people, that there are bigger conservative communities and that people know about them. So they're really craving for connection. So if you happen to come there, be sure you'll get a warm welcome in any of our uh, conservative communities. And so that's, uh, that, that's the great thing about Jews, I think, that when, whenever, and that's, about, that's something that I love about Judaism, that whenever you come, you, are, you can be a little bit at home. You always meet people who are local and who have something in common with you. We do have a common language, and even if it's a humor, you know, it's easier for, for us to start to understand the uh, Odessa humor after a while. Okay, I think there's no more questions. So thank you very much. I really enjoy, enjoy the tour. Uh, the last question, what about Aliyah? I will answer that. I don't know, what about Aliyah? <laughs> what about that? Who knows about that? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, guys. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I will be happy to arrange the tour to the Zionist Odessa and to see how the Odessa moved to Tel Aviv, to my place. And one day, definitely, we will do it together. But I hope you enjoyed it. In the tour in the time of Corona, the flight when you can't fly uh, to uh, my Odessa. So thank you very much, guys, and I hope to see you uh, one more time. Thank you. Thank Bye you to everyone. Bye. You explained.